Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Dorf, your vice chair. I'm stubbing in for Claire. Uh, she had another meeting to go to today. Uh, this is uh, now uh, Thursday, uh, October 24th. Uh, thank you for everybody attending. Uh, may we have roll call, please? All right. So, Alan Forrest? Here. Alejandra? Here. Anne Marie? Here. Asia? Here. Claire? Here. Fred? Here. Eric? Here. Kristen? Here. Matt? Here. Rob? Here. Scott Colt? Here. Scott Oldendorf? Here. And Steve Foley? Here. We have a full roster today, full quorum. Standing room only. <laughs> okay, very good. Thank you very much. Just want to uh, remind everybody, please mute your microphones. This will help ensure there's no feedback or background noises that may interfere with the speaker. If a committee, if a committee member uh, would like to speak or ask a question, uh, please use the raise your hand feature. Remember to lower your hand once uh, your question has been answered and or uh, you have finished speaking. When you are ready to speak, please unmute your microphone. This is especially important uh, during votes. Don't forget, though, to mute your microphone when finished. As a reminder, uh, audience members are only permitted to speak uh, during the call uh, to the audience uh, unless called upon by the committee. This meeting is being recorded to satisfy our open meeting uh, law requirements. Uh, if everybody could rise up for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, right now, we have a call to the audience. Does anybody have any comments or anything they need to say during the call to the audience? Hearing none, uh, we'll jump over to safety share. Uh, does everybody, uh, does anybody have anything to offer for during safety share? And let's not try and have Jackson do everything again. <laughs> Well, once again, uh, we're close to Halloween, and um, so if you're driving uh, that evening, be very careful and look out for children and their parents. Good, and I don't think we have to worry about anything, but I see Steve has his coffee, so make sure you don't burst your tongue. Uh, but everybody that uh, was able to attend in person today, they were rewarded with a breakfast burrito. So we're eating your breakfast burrito um, in remembrance of all of you that can't make it here today. <laughs> Any other safety shares? Okay. Um, so let's just be careful for Halloween that's coming up around the corner. And also just watch out. Uh, the main thing that everybody has to worry about, the seasonal uh, levels of the sun. The sun is... Uh, Coming up later, it's going down earlier, uh, angles of the sun uh, blinding you in your eyes as you're driving, uh, morning and in the afternoon, so just be careful with the sun. Okay, we'll just jump straight to approval of the minutes. Uh, hopefully everyone has had an opportunity to read the minutes. Are there any uh, correction amendments uh, or anything that anybody's noted in the meeting? Uh, minutes uh, from September 26, Thursday, September 26, 2024. Okay, thank you very much. We got some perfect minutes again. Um, so we're going to jump straight over to. Oh, okay. I'm a little rusty. I haven't uh, done the chair for a little while. Um, <laughs> 
Um, do I have a motion to accept the minutes? So I move we accept the minutes from last meeting. Great. Thank you very much. All in favor say aye. 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 And any um, abstains or nays? Okay, hearing none, uh, the minutes are so approved. Uh, next on the agenda is our director's update from our Jackson Jenkins. Uh, he's going to be talking about uh, 2024 reportable incidences and uh, uh, staffing employee uh, related topics, et cetera. Thank you, Scott. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. Uh, I just uh, still like to brag a little bit about our safety performance this uh, calendar year, the way it's typically reported. We've been running with just two recordable injuries for the, the entire 10 months until this earlier this month in October. We had our third incident, but you know, I wish I wish there was a different accounting methodology. We had an, an employee in a county truck parked, not parked, but stopped at a stoplight waiting for the light to change. And somebody was uh, probably texting while driving and ran into the back of them. And so, you know, with those those type of uh, incidents and the concern of maybe whiplash or a little neck injury or something, just out of precaution, we send the employee down to Ahmed to, just to get checked out. He didn't really want to go. He said he was fine, but he went down there. And, you know, they kind of put him through some, you know, physical therapy type motions to make sure he had all his range of motion and everything was fine. And he did, but that counts as physical therapy, which makes things recordable. Plus, they wrote him a prescription for a muscle relaxant or something of that nature in case he got sore or stiff overnight. He'd never filled the prescription and he came back to work, you know, the next day. Everything was fine. He's fine. But nonetheless, that goes down as our third recordable injury. And, you know, it's a bummer because we're really on a great, you know, sometimes people just see the number and they'll say, oh, now you're at three. But still, uh, it's the best we've done. And so we're really proud of that. But it's unfortunate we did pick up our third one and, and in a way that, you know, kind of makes you feel. Our key focus to make sure nobody gets hurt and everybody goes home safe when they're done. Um, I, I also I'll, I'll share, this is kind of a, a sad story. It is a sad story, but one of our, our new hires, he's been with us, you know, maybe five or six weeks, so a little over a month, uh, a young man, a 31 year old gentleman that um, is a veteran. He was a Marine He joined our utility maintenance group over in conveyance. Well, on Friday, this past Friday after work, his girlfriend and her mother and him went down to go enjoy the weekend in Rocky Point, and um, he ended up getting killed, getting shot by bandits on the road down to Rocky Point, been in the news. And, um, you know, just very sad. He seemed like a very good young man, and uh, we were glad to have him on our team, but I just thought I'd share, you know, you never know how activities in the world touch everybody, and we were no exception. So, sad news for us. Um, you know, staffing, I, I always am trying to, that's, it seems like it's been way more of my time on staffing than on sewage issues. It's always staffing and employee issues. Um, we've still been in the mid 30 ish range of vacancies. You know, we have a department of 399 budgeted positions or just rounded off to 400 for simple math, but just under 40 vacancies. So still just under 10% vacancy rate. And right now, I'm, I'm a little concerned. I hope it doesn't exceed 40. We've been keeping up below 40. Our goal is to get down to 20. You know, it's just there's a time lapse on how long it takes to hire someone. So you're always going to have some vacancy rate. But I wish it wasn't as high as 10% or almost 10%. But the county, I think maybe we've mentioned, and if I haven't, um, the county is switching, upgrading all of its software for finance, for HR, for everything. We're going with a product called Workday. And we started that transition already. But uh, one of the later items in the transition is all of our uh, human resource software. So we're actually, it's not what I would call a hiring freeze, but there's going to be a hiring blackout period of about a month long 
because we have to shut down the old system and open the new system. And so we won't be posting jobs on the internet and you know recruiting for, I think it's in late November to mid December, so somewhere you know late mid to November to December, about a month's time. Um, but hopefully that'll you know we can jump back with the new system and just keep right on going and keep filling the positions we need to fill. But that is something we're going to have to contend with. And so we're trying to making a mad left scramble and dash to try and fill from the current recruitments that are out, making sure we're not bottlenecking ourselves. You know, getting all of our interview questions and our panels and our schedules ready. To just um, one last push for hiring, and we'll see where we end up. But that's a uh, one of the challenges right now. Um, other than that, I'm going to keep it short, believe it or not, because um, <laughs> the next three speakers are phenomenal. They're the, the great topics uh, you all have wanted to hear about. And so we'll just move on to that unless somebody has a question for me about the department. And we have their hand up. On the hiring issue, I think it was a couple meetings ago you had mentioned that the county was thinking of eliminating positions that were open for a certain amount of time and that that might affect the department because you were having trouble hiring. What what has happened with that? Um, you know, I, I know it's it's been happening in some other departments. We've been dynamic in just what we're doing and how we're doing it to keep positions. You know, we got some that are closing in on six months or so. But so far, we have not been called in to fight for any positions that they want to remove that are at or above the eight, eight months or 240 days. So knock on wood, we can keep keep things turned over and going as best we can. But I know that day is inevitable. Some, some position we're just not going to be able to do much with. And uh, we'll, we'll cross that bridge when we get there. But right now, it has not impacted us in any way, good or bad. So far, I'm worried, but um, stay tuned. We'll can, I'll continue to give updates, especially if we get into that eight month uh, criteria and I have to go sing and dance to fight for a position to keep it. Or if I lose and they take a position, which would be bad news for us. So. Yeah, if you can give us updates, because I think that's something that concerns me and hopefully the rest of the board, if you lose positions and if you have to sing and dance, maybe we can sing and dance as well. So. Updates would be great. Okay. And, and one thing on that topic is, you know, here we got a couple of positions that are at least at six months, and we're going to have an automatic month of blackout period, which they haven't indicated that that will count against us or not. They may give us an extra month as a result of this, but I hope that's the case. I hope we're just reasonable in the county's efforts and policies. Um, to not de be a detriment to what we're doing in the department. And I think we're very uh, minimally select staff. We've been right sizing for years, and I think we're in a good place. And we just need to keep getting these, you know, the pipeline and the wheel turning to keep people coming in as people leave and see where it goes. Ellen, you had a question for Jackson? Not not a question, just a clarification. There is a board policy and an admin procedure related to uh, vacant positions. The board adopted a policy this past spring that said if a position has been vacant for more than 240 days, it will be reviewed for elimination. We did the first round of those. The, the policy was implemented on July the 1st which means that the first round of uh, eliminations was on October the 1st. Departments were provided the list at um, September the 1st in order for them to review any position that was going to be vacant for 240 days or greater. The departments have an opportunity to request an appeal in uh, in this first round, uh, about 50% of the appeals were granted. 25% uh, of the positions ended up being filled. And another amount, um, about 25% were eliminated. Um, that's the board policy. Um, it, it requires, a, and it will happen again in December. On December 1st, departments will be given a list of positions 
that will be at 240 days or greater on January the 1st. And they will have until, you know, um, they will have the month of December to take a look at those positions and write a formal appeal to their, in this case, Jackson would need to write a letter of appeal to Carmine DeBonis if wastewater had any positions that met that criteria. So that's a board policy um, that was adopted. Uh, well, we started talking about it with the board in February, but it went into implementation July the 1st. So I just wanted to make sure that you had all of the information on that. Uh, Jackson, I had one question. Um, I remember uh, the work, you said the Workday software uh, came in for the county. I remember when they did the last uh, complete county software change. What was uh, different about this software compared to the other one? Because I thought the other one's pretty dang good. Um, so can you give just a little highlight why they did this? Uh, I, I don't know if Ellen has a response for that one. I'll defer to her, but uh, okay. the software gets outdated and uh -huh. doesn't meet the needs of the county. And periodically you would look for upgrades or better, better mousetraps. And I'm guessing in general, that's the decision that's made. Okay. Does so, anybody have? Go ahead, Ellen. Okay. Um, so we were on uh, CGI for more than a dozen years, about two and a half, almost three years ago. Um, a, we needed to do either a major upgrade of the CGI software or uh, do an RFP to uh, replace the software. The decision was made that it would be appropriate to do an RFP. The vendor at the time, CGI, did compete for um, the ability to stay the software that we were using. One of the changes that the county was trying to make was to move the software from on-prem software to cloud-based software uh, so that uh, updates and uh, changes to that software that the software vendor was adding were added to our environment in a seamless manner. That was one of the issues we had with the CGI off, um, software was getting the updates implemented in a timely manner. So we went through a major RFP process that lasted uh, way too long in my opinion, but I think it lasted like 18 months. We started the implementation um, almost a year ago maybe a year ago in Jan, and we did go live with the procurement and the financial and the capital management software in July. And as Jackson has indicated, we will be bringing on the human capital side, the HR, the payroll, the timekeeping on December the 15th, at which point we will have fully migrated from all previous softwares to this new Workday Plus suite of softwares. Very good, I mean, thank you. Sure. That's really appreciated. I didn't realize this was going on behind the scenes, but thank you for all the work that you and uh, everybody's done in procurement. Uh, are there any more questions for Jackson? Eric. Eric. Yes, sir. Not a bunch of a question, but I, I wonder if we shouldn't at our next uh, meeting have a conversation regarding the board policy uh, and, and uh, retiring people uh, off of the uh, help needed list and maybe take a, take a look at it, provide our input to the board so that they can um, maybe take another look at it in a in a different manner. I hate to see I hate to see our hands hamstrung by losing a position because we couldn't get it filled because in the environment that we are working in now, finding employees is not the easiest job in the book. And if you were to pull the pin on a job or a job position, I think you're 
you're starting to then go down the rabbit hole where you start decreasing the, yeah, you decrease the number of employees, but you also then add more work onto that employee base because there's never the opportunity to look at bringing that person, a new person on board to fill the positions that are, they, that are needed to satisfy the requirements of the of the whole department. We can Ellen, Ellen, you had additional comments? <clears throat> Yes, um, I'd be happy to put together something that talks about the genesis of the uh, vacant position board policy, as well as the administrative procedures that were drafted. They were discussed at the board um, at the board level in the board meetings, um, as I indicated, for a number of months. So if you would like to have something like that, I will be happy to put something together. Um, when is the, the next, when is your next meeting? The next meeting is November 21st and we have plenty of time if you'd like to give a presentation then. Um, just give me a second. So we're temporarily on I future agenda item. We'll go back. <laughs> <laughs> you jumped the gut, Eric. Yes, Sorry. I I do not have uh, any conflicts that I can't rearrange on the twenty first. So I will be happy to put together a, a, some kind of presentation on that. Just as an aside. Again, more useful information, and I apologize that it's coming across disjointedly because I didn't realize this would be a topic of conversation. But there are a number of outs for departments, relief valves, if you will, um, for either getting a new, getting if you lose a position, if you can show the need, getting that position back. We have streamlined the request for new positions so that it is no longer the ordeal that it was a number of years ago. There's also a, a, a new um, designation, if you will, it's called hard to fill. If a job has been deemed hard to fill uh, by the department and HR working together to meet certain criteria, if it is a hard to fill job classification, those are automatically exempted from the um, vacant position review process but i'll be happy to put together something for you and so jeanette how when if the meeting's on the 21st when do you need it from me because i need to work backwards um two seconds sure so the meeting's on the 21st i would need it by say the 12th or the 13th okay so basically you need it by because I'm on vacation the entire week of the 11th, so you're going to need it by the 8th. Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Just one thing to add to this one. Hi, Ellen, it's Sarah Davis um, in the corner over here. Uh, but I want to underscore what Ellen Moulton just highlighted about the hard to fill positions. I think overall, when we just put out our vacancy rates across the county, it has improved almost nine percent in the past few years but that huge number two the hard to fill positions our hr team has really taken a proactive role on recruitment or kind of creative ways to outreach on hard to fill positions and i think that's really monumental to kind of get creative while we're looking at vacancy rate improvements but while we're also looking at kind of the cost savings of long-term open positions there is a lot of strategies we can deploy to recruitment it on hard to fill. So I just wanted to underscore what Alan said, but she will present in November. Thank you, thank you. Very good. Thank you. Uh, any additional questions for Jackson? Okay, um, we'll go on to the next agenda, which is the Living River uh, Report uh, with Claire and Luke uh, from the Sonoran Institute. The screen. <laughs> it's clear. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't. I saw that on the agenda. I didn't realize. Oh, wait, fine. You have a seat. Thank you. I have not been here in person, and I, I guess last when we presented virtually, I was up there, and it's fun to see this side of the room this morning. Um, 
Please, yes. Okay. Um, well, thank you everyone for having me join you. Um, here to give you guys an update on the Living River Project. And for those of you that are not familiar with Sonoran Institute, we are a conservation nonprofit working throughout the Colorado River Basin, but we were founded here in Tucson, so we've been working in some capacity along the Santa Cruz River and in the watershed since our founding in 1990. And we are, we have a vision of the river as a living and flowing river that's the foundation of our community's health and prosperity. I also want to acknowledge that the river flows through the homes and lands of the Autumn and the Yaqui, whose relationships with the land and river continue to this day. And uh, we worked on this statement with tribal representatives and had it finalized about a year ago. And we're excited that this statement is now included on in our Living River Report. Um, just a reminder of where we are in the Santa Cruz River watershed. So um, we're in the northern part um, near Agua Nueva and Tres Rios, where there's two facilities releasing water into the river. And then some of this water also is released into the downtown reach with the heritage um, project from Tucson Water. And so this is the part of the watershed that I'll be focusing on with today's update. And though you hear from me and from Luke frequently or at these uh, meetings and updates, we're just part of a larger team. So it's not just Sonoran Institute. We're really lucky to have this incredible partnership with the county and have Tucson Water on board too. And so we have three kind of parts of this larger project, which is the incredible work that the wastewater staff here does to produce this high quality water that's going into the river and supporting so many benefits. Um, there's restoration and management, as well as monitoring efforts that happen along the river. And then there's really diverse outreach efforts. And these three um, leaves of our flower here, petals of our flower, all fall under the Living River Project umbrella. And Kimberly Baisa is here too. She's part of the, the team I get to work with regularly. So with this year's report, um, we are celebrating at 10 years of clean water, which is huge. This is such, uh, I can't believe we're already at 10 years. Um, in 2013, we produced the first report, which was the baseline to give us an idea of what, what the river conditions were like before the upgrades to the now Agua Nueva and Tres Rios facilities. And since then, we've had a lot of reports highlighting all the great work um, that's been done and the improvements along the river. So many positive things. I'm regularly telling people how lucky I feel that we have so much positive news to share about the river. Um, and so this year's report is focused on reminding people of this incredible uh, fortune we have to have such high quality of water going into the river and that it's been 10 years of it. And the best way to look at that is um, looking at the levels of ammonia, which is a form of nitrogen, very common in our wastewater. Plants love the extra nitrogen, but it's toxic at high concentrations for things living in the water. So fish and our invertebrate community. And so before the upgrade, we had high level um, or high concentrations, largely due to the fact that our plants were getting old and we needed to um, install a newer technology. And when we had exceedances of the standard that's set up for protection of our aquatic wildlife, these exceedances were uh, on average 14 milligrams per liter above the standard. And I want to note the standard varies with pH and temperature, but generally two milligrams per liter or less is safe for aquatic life. 
And immediately after, and for all 10 years, um, we've had very low levels of ammonia. And in 2023, the average was one milligram per liter. And on the few occasions, there aren't as many exceedances now. And when we do have an exceedance, it's Hi. by by very little, 0 0.09. Was there a question? I think it was a sneeze. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I it's heard it. Tight. I heard it as a why, but maybe that's because my brain was was wanting to highlight that you know wastewater treatment processes are very complex, and it's the team I know is working really hard to maintain all the perfect conditions to maximize the removal of ammonia. So occasionally these processes need to be adjusted, but you know. 14 milligram per liter above the standard versus 0.9 is a huge uh, decrease and really something we should be proud of. Um, but the county is not does not stop just at producing high quality water. And so this year we're highlighting that we're Pima County Wastewater Reclamation Department is starting to chart a new course for the former Roger Road facility. And this is a 50 acre property that has um, an important history as being the first facility in Pima County um, to treat our wastewater. And that we have started, well, the county, I shouldn't say we, but I'm saying we as in the county and <laughs> the partnership um, has created a new park in the southwest corner. Um, I don't know if you can see. No. Okay. So in the southwest corner, there's the ponds at the bottom that it, um, form a new park called Agua Nueva. Yeah, is, you see the white roof building? It's just at the right of the two buildings. Oh, yeah. I was trying to see my cursor. Oh, there you can kind of see my cursor right here in the in the ponds and there's been new plantings and some native fish that have been put in these ponds. And so this is just the start of a vision in addition to um, a Brownsfield grant from the EPA on the, I'm not sure, a large grant, uh, Kimberly can give you details on that if you guys wanna know more. Um, that's gonna do some remediation of some of the contaminants in the buildings that are on site. But this is really exciting first steps towards um, reimagining what this facility can be and what this footprint can be. Just upstream of here and south, um, flood control is putting in a new pedestrian bridge. And this is going to be really helpful for users of the loop. Um, there's not a lot of east and west bank connections. Uh, through this reach, so it'll provide a, a new opportunity to change which side of the river you're on. Be really great. And they've already started working on this new bridge. Um, so those are just some highlights of some of the policies and management of, and exciting things along the river, but how is the river itself doing? And that there's a lot of different things we could touch on, but I'm just going to highlight a few things that are featured in the report this year. So, as, as I said, water quality remains high, and this is supporting diverse aquatic wildlife. Um, our annual fish survey that's happening in two weeks uh, continues to document a lot of different species, and that though many of these species are native. We do have some native, non-native. Um, we do have a native fish, the Gila top minnow, and I'm going to touch a little bit more on the Gila top minnow. So the top minnow returned to the river really close here to Agua Nueva in 2017, and then we reintroduced the Gila top minnow in the Heritage Project reach in 2020. And so since then we've been tracking the top minnow to see how they're doing. This is a small endangered fish that looks a lot like the Western mosquito fish. So you can see at the bottom of the slide, there's they're very similar and very difficult to identify in the field unless you know what you're looking for and it's time consuming. So to minimize the stress on the fish, 
we do a random collection of these the fish from this family, and then we identify um, this group of fish in the lab um, to species. And it's from this randomly grabbed sample that we can track trends. And so that's what these charts are showing here. And what we're seeing is that in the Heritage Project Reach, the top minnow are doing really well. They took a, they had a little slow start. Um, they were introduced in 2020 and 2021. They were still there, but we weren't finding very many, um, or at least not as easily. And now we're easily finding them and the mosquito fish have declined there. So that's looking good for Heritage Project Reach. And in the Northwest Tucson to Marina Reach, um, this is the data from the site closest to Awanueva. Uh, we have the top minnow have been doing really well, and we're not really sure what's been going on um, or what happened last year that resulted in this potential decline. But fish surveys, or, sorry, fish populations do fluctuate, and so there could just have been some weird thing that happened last year. And so I'm really interested in seeing this year how the top minnow are doing, whether this is a real decline or if it was just a weird um, blip. Our surveys down in Santa Cruz County have found similar, you know, ups and downs. And so it's not, this is not the, uh, as negative or as it looks it's like. It's not the end of the world. <laughs> <laughs> Um, to further complicate things, there's a third species that looks just like these two, um, and it is a hybrid, an all-female hybrid of the Gila top minnow with a close, closely uh, related relative from Mexico, so non-native because it's a hybrid of a non-native and a, a native fish, and that hybrid you can only identify using genetics or looking at their teeth <laughs> so we are still we have not um we're partnering with u of a and they are still trying to look at the past fish samples to see how many of these hybrids might be present but at this point in time we don't know how many of these top minnow might actually be this third species and so maybe at some point we will have the ability to track all three um, species. Another comparison of the two reaches that we were able to do this year was highlighting data from the Bobcats in Tucson Research Project. And hopefully you guys can see all these little points <laughs> on the map. It's a little harder here in person. But um, Bobcats in Tucson had radio collared a bunch of different Bobcats, some of which are living along the river. And near the Heritage Project reach, these bobcats were using a very large area, Tumamak Hill and Sentinel Peak, but also were found going into the river. So that was really exciting that even though, you know, the Heritage Project is so new, there's not a ton of water going in and the vegetation's still getting um, started, uh, that the bobcats are still going into the river. In comparison to Northwest Tucson to Marana Reach, where just north of Ina, we have two bobcats that are true river cats. They're spending almost all of their time in the river corridor, which is a really cool thing to see. So all the water, the really uh, lush vegetation, there's plenty of resources. It seems that there are plenty of resources for them because they're spending all their time there. So. Maybe over time, we'll see a similar uh, pattern with the Heritage Project reach. Uh, but either way, have now documented the importance of the river for bobcats. And Heritage is also home to some relocated mud turtles. There are mud turtles on the river through Northwest um, Tucson or Northwest to Marana reach, and these turtles were relocated from, I believe, the um, that museum, the wildlife museum on your way out to Gates Pass that shut down. I think that's where these guys came from. While their radio transmitters were still working, they were happily just documented staying in the pond that had developed 
near Heritage, this reach has the most variable conditions. Um, and so in 2023, we had a small pond. You can see that circles identifying um, a location where the vegetation builds up the cattails and such where you can't even see the pond in the image, but that's where you see the turtles. And unfortunately that pond did not make it through 2024 monsoon season, <laughs> but for a while these mud turtles were, were happily there. So um, just a little bit of water is providing important habitat. So those are just some highlights from the report, but this report and all the work, it's really the foundation of important information to share with the community. And we are working hard to bring people to the river so they can appreciate uh, the river and all the work that uh, the county and the city are doing to manage and maintain this resource. And so Pima County has some great programming. They have Living River Awards, Youth Art and Poetry Program, um, that is also tied with a, a contest with a traveling art exhibit, really great. And then they also have diverse um, other youth and adult programs. I actually was just talking to one Pima County staffer yesterday and didn't realize that they had other um, field trips and programs in addition to Living River Words that get youth thinking about water in the desert and how important it is. So that's really great. And along with Pima County and many other partners, Sonora Institute just hosted our first full Santa Cruz River Dragonfly Festival. We have done a dragonfly themed event for the last, I think this is our sixth year, but it's become such a popular thing. And we had so many different events within this what used to be just one day, <laughs> it spanned the whole month and it was really fun. We had great turnout. I'm still working on the final numbers, but we had um, over a hundred people come for our tours on September 28th. We had virtual and in-person presentations. There was a bio blitz hosted by University of Arizona and um, Pima County had lots of fun dragfly crafts that people could pick up at the library. So Nord Institute's also studying the trash in the river and we are hosting trash cleanups. We are not alone to host trash cleanups though. There are lots of groups. There's really been a, a increase in the interest for trash cleanups in the last few years. And just in 2023, um, I forget the number of trash cleanups, but 533 people came out and we removed over almost 15 tons of trash. And the trash study has shown that a lot of this trash that's in the river are uh, lightweight floatable food packaging. And we're actually piloting the first trash trap, maybe in Arizona. Um, uh, this is work that Luke is leading, and um, it's down near Nogales, and uh, we just installed it this summer. It's looking like it's doing well, and hopefully we'll, keep, we'll get more data and be able to implement it throughout the watershed, not just a single place, as one way to try and tackle this issue. Although trash interestingly is proving to be a really great way to engage the community as well people come out and we had a cleanup in january where 300 people came for one trash cleanup and that people feel really good about getting out there it's something concrete to connect with the river uh so good work with that and then we have Santa Cruz River Research Days, which started as a way to connect all professionals working along the Santa Cruz so we could learn from each other, but it's really growing to be um, even an event interested of interest to the general public. People that just wanna know more about the river and hear more information about um, all the research and conservation and management and policy all things related to the river, both natural and cultural. And we've been hosting this as a bilingual event for the last 
um, four years. Um, and last this year was the first uh, the first time we were doing it in person and virtual. Um, I don't know, sorry, second time <laughs> that we did that. And we're getting better at it. And we actually had people coming from Mexico, which was great. And we had hosted a bio blitz along the river right near the border. So I just wanted to give you guys some quick highlights. Um, I have hard copies of the English and the Spanish version of the report here. If anyone has not yet received their copy of the report. And if you want to know even more, there's a supplemental online only report that gives more information about the notable achievements that we're highlighting in the report, as well as all the trends for the data that's being collected. And I'll leave it at that. I don't know if there's time for questions. I don't want to take up too much time in your business. I have one question. Uh, you said you introduced uh, the various fish uh, in. Uh, where did you get your various fish from? And also, it was part of the breeding program that was over the years on the storm, is what you see. Good question. So, the only fish that were introduced were helotop minnow and longfin dace. And the helotop minnow came from the Santa Cruz River in Santa Cruz County. So, we went down. Um, and collected a bunch of fish and then just helped them move downstream. <laughs> and that was an effort led by Game and Fish, um, but for Arizona Game and Fish and Sonoran Institute and other Pima County and others collaborated too. And then for the longfin days, the county led that effort with Game and Fish to uh, collect some longfin days from Cienega Creek, which is on the it's part of the Santa Cruz watershed, but on the uh, east side of the watershed, and they were doing really well there, so it felt okay to take some fish from there and brought them to both Heritage and um, right here in Agua Nueva Reach. And as far as we can tell, the days might need another helping hand to get here because we haven't we found one <laughs> last year. And sometimes that happens. Dace are a very hardy species, but uh, maybe we just didn't, they could still be there and we just didn't detect them in our survey, but we might need to help them again. And the non-native fish uh, were not introduced legally in any case. So not, there's probably diverse ways that they've been getting into the system. And are you going to be having, when do you think the next uh, dragonfly, I guess you call it leak? Is going to be taking them next year? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yes, we've been doing it in September. Well, dragonflies love heat, and so they're love, you know, you can easily see them go to the river, any water body. I've actually seen them in my own backyard, and I have no water feature in my backyard, but not too far from the river. So they do travel longish distances, but you can see them more when it's hot out. So we have this balancing, trying to provide an event with lots of colorful dragonflies for people to see while also hoping that it's not too hot. And we actually had a record heat wave during our last weekend of the festival where we had um, four sites with nine different tours and we still had a lot of people coming out, which was really exciting. us. You know, Arizona, we, we go out whether it's hot or cold. <laughs> Matt, you had a question for uh, Claire? Yes, thank you. Uh, Claire, great presentation. Always enjoy hearing the updates uh, from your organization. Uh, one question I did have was about the pedestrian bridge that you referred to. Do you mm -hmm. happen to know how the funding is being handled for that? Is it a county project, city? Uh, flood control, transportation, wastewater, uh, how that's being paid for? That is a great question. It's definitely a county regional flood control district project, but I don't know. Oh, maybe Kimberly knows. Oh, no, she doesn't know. Um, <laughs> I'm not certain on the exact source of funding, but it is a county uh, flood control district project. Um, 
Yeah. Okay. Anybody have any additional questions for Claire? Well, thank you very much, Claire. That was very informative. Appreciate that. Uh, next on the agenda, um, let's see here. Um, is the Pima County uh, Sustainable Action uh, Plan uh, for the County Operations, uh, Climate Action uh, Plan for County Operations. And that's going to be done by Sarah Davis. So, Sarah, it's all yours. I don't know that you can follow up on Claire's comment. Um, and I will tell you, Claire, I have two sure. devastated toddlers that could not make it to the Dragonfly Week. And they live the Dragonflies. <laughs> My car was destroyed on that day going to your so to your tour. <laughs> all right. I think we can all see it. Hi, everybody. I'm Sarah Davis. I'm one of the senior advisors at the County Administrator's Office and um, have gotten the honor to embark upon a new chapter of climate action for Pima County with our department, subject matter experts, uh, regional partners, it, as we kind of grow our 2025 to 2030 goals. So part of this presentation will be some of our results from our sustainable action plan for county operations and how we kind of closed out our current iteration between 2018 and 2024, 25. Um, and then some of the new innovation space that's happening across the county departments at uh, the direction of our elected body, the Board of Supervisors, and the commitment from the county administrator and our deputy county administrators. So wanted to talk through in, in fall of 2023, when we gave our 2022 SACO, which is our Sustainable Action Plan for County Operations update, there was a call to action to kind of re-engage climate action across interdisciplinary departments um, and how we look at that. And that was in August of 2023. Uh, it was an original iteration of nine department directors that had already been involved in the Sustainable Action Plan for County Operation, but also really integrating an interdisciplinary model across our public works departments and our health and human services departments and our central departments. That group of nine department directors has now grown to over 24 department directors, all of which appointing a secondary group to support these efforts within the Climate Action Advisory Committee. So collectively, that represents over 60 dedicated staff to our commitment to climate action and sustainability across our county departments and the region. Uh, this also includes our educational component of these efforts, which is within our Green Stewards group, which kind of follow along with our key priorities and do educational seminars for all staff to engage in what the county is directing. Um, our Sustainable Action Plan for County Operations really was resulting from monumental board resolutions. There are three of them to which we enacted our goals through 2025 and, and really highlighted mitigation strategies. So carbon emission reductions, work in our landscapes, water was another priority area, materials and workforce. As we grew this climate action executive team and climate action advisory committee, we did a lot of feedback gathering across our county departments to really look at what other things should we be prioritizing in addition to our mitigation strategies? And those came into four real climate priority areas that we tackled over the 2024 period. And really those are representative of more adaptation and resilience strategies to build on our mitigation successes. Um, the four areas that we really prioritized in no given order were greenhouse gas emissions reductions, which build upon the SAPCO tenants, Resilience to extreme heat and our adaptation to extreme heat, that was one of the most commonly mentioned priorities on how we tackle extreme heat and align to kind of bridge the gaps for our vulnerable community members as well. Uh, water came up as one of the key priority areas in a couple different ways, both scarcity and degradation, but also access to and innovation and in how we utilize 
reusable water reuse strategies, a lot of the innovation that happens here on this campus, and how do we look into kind of our floodplain areas and, and water harvesting strategies. Um, and the other core priority area that came up indirectly, but as a component of extreme heat and, and some dialogue across our heat risk month was the role of invasive species, specifically non-native invasive grasses and the impact to wildfire risk. So we did tackle that as well. And I'll describe how we kind of do this like spoke and wheel hub model because all of these priorities are representative of other interdisciplinary groups of the county and the region. Um, the other task that this group tackled over the 2024 period was the completion and really getting a data baseline for how we closed out our 2024 sustainable action plan and where we're standing to really truly build cohesively through not just our mitigation strategy, but innovative models that also address things like public health, workforce development, and really kind of target how the county operations are impacting our regional partners and also our disproportionately affected and vulnerable communities. Each of these priorities we've tackled, we've really done a lot of qualitative feedback gathering models, not just across our staff, but we look at the county's asset bank and what the county's footprint is, but we also look at who are the regional partners in the area, whether it be other municipalities or tribal partners, community-based organizations, non-governmental agencies, because sometimes the county won't have the lead role but sometimes we can support with our asset bank. So we really wanted to look at this a little bit more broadly. And part of that was through seed funding from the EPA. We received a $1 million grant, our Department of Environmental Quality, to do our priority climate action plan to really strategize on how we reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, but do it in a regional way. And so we'll talk about that in a couple slides, but that's just a highlight of this presentation and what we've accomplished over a year to build on all of the amazing work that the county has done across its departments leading up to now from 2007. So I could talk about all of these successful projects and success stories that we are highlighting in our SAFCO um, that was just released. I'll make sure you all get a copy of it. Jenna, I'll send it out to you. Okay. Um, some really cool stuff, especially for this audience in the water space, I think, um, the way we look at our greenhouse gas emissions is really through our county facilities, regional wastewater reclamation De development department, and our fleet. Our WRD reduced not only their energy use usage, but they surpassed their goal a year ahead of schedule, which is monumental through the innovation that is done at this campus. So hats off to you, Jackson, and the team over here. Um, some of the really cool stuff that happened over this period with our flood district um, and enhancements to stormwater parks. I really want to highlight Alvado and, and Kimberly, you can probably talk to this too. Um, really phenomenal drainage improvement projects, just to like really bolster this innovation capacity, especially in a qualified census tract, creating a multi-use space, moving water, creating a, a facilitation of heritage food sites on the property. It was just a beautiful project. Um, we've grown our native plant nursery, we've had reductions to our landfill volume and waste, and we really underscored the importance of workforce and education in this space to help grow these priorities and create a comprehensive enterprise-wide approach. Um, I really want to underscore the carbon goals, and there's a couple of graphics here, but I really want to highlight the right side graphic and the two lines that are really important to for our county operation successes are the blue and the green lines. We had a goal for 2025 to reduce our carbon emission impact by 78,000 metric tons of carbon emission equivalent. The green includes, it would be what our carbon emissions would be without TEP's solar um, capacity, which is still under our goal. So that's a huge, tip of the hat to our county operations and our facilities, our fleet and wastewater work here. But we were able to surpass our goal by almost 10,000 metric tons of carbon emissions equivalent. On the left next to target one, we did expand the graphic to include our 2030 goal because as you can see, we are 
we are about halfway there already, and it's not even 20, 25 yet. So this really showcases some, some actionable data on how we have improved our emissions footprint here in our county, but also how do we think about what our next goal should be and what, what should we be targeting? So that is a huge success story in our number one um, big fix mitigation effort. I won't spend too terribly much time on this, but we do have a climate outlook update in each of our staff code periods. Um, I think as everybody knows, 2024 is now the hottest year on record for the region with over, well, at the time of this presentation, I think it's still 112, but it might be a few, one or two more than that. But we had 112 days of 100 plus degree weather. Um, a lot of those happening in late September and early October, which was kind of unprecedented. 2020 was the hottest year prior to that, with 2023 having some of the most extreme heat days in July. So some of those 105 plus days. Um, over the SAPCO period, so the 2018 through 2024-25 period, um, we had an average annual increase of eight or more days over 100 degrees every year. And over the six year period compared to the 1901 to 2000 average growing over 35 days, which essentially is adding an extra month of summer. So National Weather Service, we now measure aligned with them. Our, our summer measurement really now is April through October instead of May through September, which it used to be. Um, so just some data on that. And um, I think in October, the first 14 days, 13 were over 100, with four of those being over 105 in October. So I wanted to highlight the climate outlook because one of the key strategies that was requested as we grew our sustainability footprint and looked at our comprehensive climate priorities was how do we respond to extreme heat? But first off, we talked about this with our carbon data. We did create the group together, collectively helped inform the Priority Climate Action Plan, which is representative of a regional partnership. And this is one of the required documents for the EPA funding. Um, we developed a regional partnership with City of Tucson, Oro Valley, Tohono O'odham, among other community-based organizations and municipalities to create a comprehensive plan to reduce a regional greenhouse gas emission reduction estimated at 1.5 million tons of carbon emissions between 2025 and 2030. There were 25 distinct projects within that. A lot of those were incredibly innovative, including using artificial intelligence here at the campus to help drive down our emissions strategies, which is incredible. Um, we did not receive that funding. The funding request was $237 million. We still scored within the top tiers, so we continue to work with the EPA to look for other funding. But the great thing about this is we now have very distinct projects that we can look for other grant funding or look for other strategies to implement. And a lot of them are shovel ready. Um, one key component to the Priority Climate Action Plan, which we have applied to all of our other priorities as well, because it was so impactful, was getting feedback from the community. Getting feedback from community-based organizations that have different populations that they serve to understand what we should be prioritizing, specifically where there is a connection to our disproportionately affected and vulnerable communities, um, our qualified census tracts. How do these projects have a workforce component? So how can we build our workforce? How can we invest in jobs in this space? There's an economic impact, there's a direct economic impact, and there's also an economic vitality component for some of these strategies, and also the public health. So how are we addressing projects that directly impact public health of our community members? So that was really our first deliverable at the Climate Action Teams, which brought us to spring and we prioritized the heat response. As directed by the governor in March, there was a statewide regional effort for heat response planning, which led, which was directed in part by our public health departments across every county. So the counties maintain the public health authority, <clears throat> but just like with the priority climate action plan, <clears throat> pardon, 
we did this as a regional model. So what does the county have, but also how can we be plugging into the asset bank of the community to truly meet the needs of the community? So this effort collectively was representative of 25 agencies, including municipalities, tribes, non-governmental organizations, community members, community-based organizations, to develop a comprehensive cooling center um, network, which was over 41 sites. I think it was 41 in total. This cooling center network served over 15,000 people during the summer months and during those major storms. And we had all of these resources and very comprehensive communication strategies to kind of understand risk and get to the resilience component of how we meet the needs of our vulnerable folks in our community. Um, during those major storms in July, where we had multi-day power outages, we saw thousands of hits to our websites to find cooling centers. I think on the highest day, there was 5,000 hits to our websites to resource the community. The Board of Supervisors approved our annual Heat Awareness Week, which will, from here to forward, be the second week of May, where we deploy lots of heat resilient strategies, communications campaigns, how to identify risk. Our health department also created a three-year public health plan, just like the Priority Climate Action Plan. Each of these priorities now have a sub plan to action in a multi-year way. We also really had um, some monumental successes in doing policy at the direction and approval of our Pima County Board of Supervisors. We implemented a workforce safety ordinance for our county contractors. City of Tucson also adopted one, as did City of Phoenix. We are the first county to adopt one of these in the country. OSHA currently is looking at its heat safety protocols and it is in its public comment period right now. So I think this is something that we're seeing nationally on how do we address heat and safety practices for everybody. Um, so that was really, really expansive. And, and it, I get choked up thinking about the thousands surge from this direct effort. Um, the other priorities, which you will start to see from us, I don't want to, I, I don't want to say too much because you're going to see some really big reports and memos and strategies coming up in these two areas, but invasive species and wildfire risk. In February, our county administrator um, wrote a memo to the board kind of setting forth this interdisciplinary group of 11 departments um, that is being headed up by our conservation lands resources departments to look at strategies where we can collect and so some of the findings out of that the memo will be released in the next couple of weeks with proposals for the next year but looking at our own administrative procedures to which departments are directly doing this work and what is the strategies augmented um, communication strategies to for the public on how to identify invasive species what their risks are to public health and wildfire enhanced data capacity, because I think specifically in invasives, this is built on such a comprehensive group of community-based resources and volunteers. Volunteers doing the work in this space for mitigation of invasive species is, is expansive. Um, but also looking at how we support the redevelopment of our community wildfire protection plan from an emergency response perspective and include an expanded invasive section with that that is data-driven and enhances the community capacity to understand what the risk areas are with our invasives. So you'll see that memo come to our Board of Supervisors in the next few weeks. And the final priority that we've tackled this year is reactivating our Water Working Group, which is an interdisciplinary team of probably around eight to nine at this point departments that are redirecting comprehensive planning to address water priorities across the county departments, but also the kind of regional alignment as has been highlighted in previous presentations. But specifically the core areas of work in this space are scarcity and degradation. How are we approaching things from innovative strategies and alternate approaches to water use and collection, reducing our demand, not just in our county, but also in the region the region and water policy opportunities that we can maybe incorporate in our comprehensive planning like Pima Prospers and or other ordinances for water. So those are coming up. Um, 
we're finalizing those plans right now. And in December, we will be redirecting our effort to creating our climate action plan for county operations, which is CAPCO. All of these plans that I've talked about today will be incorporated in CAPCO in addition to building on our mitigation strategies so that we really look at mitigation, response, and resilience. Um, and there is, a, as seen by 2024, there is a response, an emergency response effort tied to some of these priorities. Um, and then looking at innovation and how can we build exciting new things that also kind of bolster the workforce, bolster our region, bolster the, our communities. And that county portion will be integrated into our regional comprehensive climate action plan, which is representative of the partners we highlighted earlier. Um, one thing I think we've learned that is data driven and as we closed out our SAPCO is how do we design a CAPCO that is malleable and scalable? Because I think, you know, we don't know what will happen in three years. We can predict, we can project, we can work with our partners um, at the University of Arizona and our climate scientists. But having a plan that is malleable and scalable um, to assure that we are meeting our own operational capacity and doing things in a data-driven and evaluative way. Um, and we will continue to design in a way that we have thus far about what is the public health impact? What are these secondary components of our efforts? And we will always continue to do this in a collaborative way about what's the county's role versus what is the regional region's role. Because just like the county directive to be enterprise-wide about this, um, I think we can all agree that region regional capacity building, that means the needs of the community. So with that, I will take any questions and thank you all for having me. Thank you for your time. Very good. Thank you, Sarah. Matt's got a question for you. Ah, yes. Thanks, Sarah. A um, couple slides ago, or I guess the one right before this, you referred to the water working group and reactivating its priorities. Uh, who's on the water working group? What organizations? Currently, we're just looking at our internal county operations, but very similarly to everything we've done, we will be looking outwards. So how are we looking at our county departments? So folks like the flood district, regional wastewater, DEQ, our, probably our facilities departments and looking at our county strategies, but also looking to folks like Tucson Water, our folks at you know, our, the Audubon Society, Sonoran Institute, all of these NGOs will be incorporated in this comprehensive planning too. So wastewater has a seat at that table. Absolutely. Thank Jackson's you. involved to any party I have. <laughs> I'm sure he goes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, also, I had a question for you. Um, I noticed on the climate uh, outlook and all that, the 2024, uh, what's the highest number? 100 uh, plus days, and we're still maybe going to have a, maybe another one yet uh, this week. Uh, but uh, the, out of curiosity, um, I see 24 was high, 20 was high. Uh, of course, that's all you had on your uh, chart. Uh, is there any cyclical patterns um, when were uh, any other high uh, years of uh, 100 plus days? I think our top three and not having National Weather Services data, because they've got their data since 1901 very readily available. Um, I think what's notable about these past few years versus other years, I think, you know, 1992 who had a really big year as well, but there's nothing really cyclical. I think what's notable is the expansion of the frequency. So since 2020, it's just every year we've said, this is hotter because, this is more extreme because. Um, and I think that is, is part of it. The other thing is our summer nighttime temperatures over this past six years, October through December, has increased at a faster rate than any other quarter of the year. Um, so that has increased at almost a degree hotter every single year. And those are our fall and winter months, right? So, so thinking through things like that in our cooler months, as those start to get hotter and our summer nighttime temperature 
got up to almost 76 degrees here in the region when it's usually hovering around 71, 72. So those sorts of things affect not only us as people, it affects our ecosystems. Luckily, we've had more rainfall, but we're still in a drought status. And so how are we looking at these extremes and what becomes our new regular, I think is what everyone's trying to I mean, find. also maybe with uh, community growth, um, city growth and concrete, more concrete, uh, um, holding in that heat. Could be, could be. And and actually for our Kafka, we are going to have our climate scientists over at CLIMAS and the University of Arizona work directly with us to look at some of these impacts. So say we look at land use planning or we look at comprehensive multi-use plans. What is the impact to some of these things? And so being more research oriented about it, I, I think it's one of those things that it is getting hotter and we are used to hot that's the thing we are accustomed to hot we have a resilient community already but it's some of these like how do we become more resilient and how do we kind of look at this as as october may have 100 degree days now and and just thinking through what that looks like from strategies if we if we have pool trainers for example do we extend them do we kind of look to all of that puts pressure on our grid, for example. And so just thinking through strategies like that, but we'll keep you updated on that because we will be incorporating climate research in this just to kind of look at what titrates what. And also second question, you talked about the cooling center. So mm -hmm. did you get a kind of a survey of uh, who the participants of the cooling center are? Is it strictly homeless or is it a wide variety of uh, people? Wide variety, but... The lion's share was our housing vulnerable folks. Um, most of our community centers were libraries. Um, we also deployed a really innovative pilot program over at the libraries, at a couple of libraries where we had uh, medical response teams there in case people needed or were going through heat injury right on, off the bat. And I think that was a really innovative strategy that we can build on. The health department is going to be releasing its final report in November or December. They employed a bunch of surveys to clean center participants to kind of see what other resources we need. Where we have gaps in our cooling centers is for pets. Um, we don't have a lot of cooling centers that accept pets. I think that's a, a prevalent issue. Uh, families, longer stays, if we do have long or sustained power outages to have overnight capacity. And how do we do a little bit more outreach? I think in partnership with Red Cross, we did a lot of public outreach to our mobile home residents as well, who are hugely at risk when there are sustained power outages and high heat temperatures. So that report will be released. There's an interim one that I believe was just released to the board Tuesday, so we can get that out to you too. Okay. Thank you very much, Sarah. Are there any other additional questions for Sarah? Uh, let's see, we got Claire Zucker. Yeah, hi. I just want to thank you for your great presentation. It was really amazing. And I think you kind of touched on this uh, a moment ago, but I was wondering about your collaboration with the university and your efforts to do some more modeling and, uh, you know, add the research aspect. Um, so I think you kind of addressed that question for me. Um, do you want to build on that at all? Yeah, we're actually working with multiple departments over at the university from our land use space um, and our partners over at Kala, the landscape architecture and planning department, our CLIMAS team, our alignment with National Weather Service by way of U of A partnerships as well. We're also working with the College of Public Health. Um, so it, it is multi-departmental, Claire, and we'll continue to grow. My philosophy is um, we can always build a longer table. No, so that that is really and, good. And uh, yeah, I was also really heartened to hear that you're looking at the mobile home population because, boy, you drive by those little hot boxes and no air conditioning frequently or very tiny ones. And it's just so scary. So I'm glad that's a focus. Yeah. Thank you, Claire. Mm -hmm. Very good. Thank you. Any additional questions for Sarah? Thank you, Sarah. Okay, Sarah, thank you very much, ma'am. Sure. Uh, next on the list is going to be uh, Jeff Cravat. He's going to be talking to us about the DOE's uh, Better Plants, Better uh, uh, Climate Program. Jeff, it's all yours. Be very sweet. <laughs>
Okay. <clears throat> so, hold on, hold on. Following up on what Sarah discussed with our, our energy reductions we've done over the last um, decade or so. Let me know. I can't see the screen very well, but on the left, Jackson signed this. Uh, we signed on with DOE better plants properly. We did our application in 2014. Our, our large plants, Agua de Hueva and Trace Rios, came online in December of 2013. 2014, we committed to try to reduce our energy footprint. And uh, so this on the left side has a 2015 letter saying, welcome to the program. We've been an innovator for, for more than a decade, research and innovation, trying to address a lot of different utility needs on both energy usage, uh, chemical usage, and trying to improve treatment processes. But Jim Doyle over here is with our process optimization team. His group is always going out trying to look for ways that we can treat wastewater better, more efficiently, with less chemical and less energy inputs. So this letter on the right, it does say we achieved a 38% uh, goal this year, our ninth year. Our target was uh, a 25% reduction over 10 years. We're now 38% next time then. So Jackson and I are always big advocates. You, you can't manage it if you don't measure. And so look at our trace reels. That's our biggest facility. That's where we do all of our central solid handling. The breakdown shows this is where our energy is used in our process. And over 55% here, that's aeration. And so at Trace Rios, we have 6,400 horsepower blowers. We have two redundant systems, the east and the west treatment trains. And uh, those have a combined 4,000 horsepower blowers and, and four 600 horsepower blowers. It's huge operation, but it's very redundant. And so what we've done in that aspect, uh, next slide, we went through all of our treatment plant processes and said where not only where are we use in the most electricity, whether it's in our salts handling, centrifuge, aeration, but is it our pumps, is it our blowers, where does it being used? So we took it down to the equipment level, individual pieces of equipment. And by far and large, it's those big blowers that are eating up most of our electricity. We use probably about five megawatts a day at Trace Rios. Next slide. So this is what the DOE really glamped on this year. How we reduced our usage. So, this uh, the scale's not showing up, but the orange line at the top that's about three megawatts. So, three megawatts out of a five is just our iteration basins, right? And the blue line that's around 2200 megawatts. And so, we've reduced it by about 26 percent. Just those. what we did in that we changed programming strategy and how these things cycle on and off, on and off. And that strategy alone saved us about 26 percent. Since then, we've installed turbo blowers. These plants are old. They came online in December 2013. Old technology. Now everybody has turbo blowers with VFDs on them. We've installed two large ones, one at each of these east and west plants right now. Those should give us much lower energy reductions and allow us to turn down instead of ramping up these big blowers all the time. We can have one blower on continuously and we'll ride the curve throughout the day with this one that's on the VFDs. Even much more efficient. Another project that we're doing. We're building an aeration center. Ollie's team designed this. It's going to go in between both of those east and west trains so we can have greater turndown capacity, take the benefit of both that's. It also gives us some operational redundancy. Should we have an electrical issue or one of those lower buildings goes down, we can still run both trains from one side or the other. So that will give us greater turndown capacity in the turbo lowers as well. We also use a lot of energy in our facility for uh, heating needs. We burn natural gas and boilers to heat our digesters and building heating needs for both industrial and domestic hot water demand. So in that big aeration area that we're installing, we're also putting two large heat exchangers. The heat coming off all these blowers is about 250 degrees. And so we're going to capture that heat, turn it into hot water, reduce our natural gas demand. So all of these are going to help our carbon footprint and reduce in those. Um, Sarah mentioned the grant that we didn't get. One of the one of the items that we had applied for in that grant. Jackson and I have two identical package plants we want to get installed at Trace Reels. We do a lot of R&D nationwide. I'm the utility chair for Water Environment Federation for Research Innovation. We want to install these two identical trains at Trace Reels and run one conventional 
and run the other one with all these new technologies pilots have to show. These are the capabilities, how you can reduce energy and because we're going to be building a Sarita regional plant in the next uh, 10 years. We really want, we don't want to duplicate stuff that we've done in the past that are very energy hawks. We would like that new facility to be as energy neutral as possible. And so if we get these two treatment trains installed here at, the, at Trace Rios, most R&D is done on really big scale. So hard to scale it up to industrial scale and things we're doing. But these two package plants, they'll be 200,000 gallons a day, both plants. It's almost real scale. That's, that's some more small facilities are bigger than those. And so this will get, give us the opportunity to do that R&D and look at what the future of wastewater treatment is going to look like. But more importantly, it's going to have something that Pima County has that doesn't exist anywhere in the country. So that will continue to get grant research dollars coming to Southern Arizona to keep keep these pilots going, keep this innovation going. So we're committed to keep uh, keep making um, energy changes. This was just the start. We're on our way, and I think we're we see the light at the end of the tunnel. We're we're racing toward it. Thank you. Any questions, anybody? Else? Anybody have any questions for Jeff? Okay, right. she did a perfect job. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. Uh, next on the agenda is uh, going to be uh, Isai. He's going to be talking about our 23-24 period three uh, expense and revenue summary. Isai, it's all yours. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'll share my screen and we'll be able to Get the presentation going. Okay. Hopefully everybody can see my screen. So as a, a period three, uh, ended September 30th, uh, this information that we have so far, uh, total um, O&M expenses, uh, our adopted budget was 104.8 million. The actions that we have received so far were 19.3 million. Uh, we're still projecting uh, to be on budget, 104.8, uh, not having us any variance so far. Uh, scrolling down, we have the total O&M expenses, including contra, depreciation, and debt services, uh, a total of 182.8. That's our adopted budget. Uh, actual so far, we're 33.1 million. And our projected is 182,892. Um, 553, giving us a variance of a uh, slightly uh, $2,000. We scroll down to the revenue. Um, our adopted budget is slightly under $200 million, 199. Our actual so far is 43.9 million. Our projection is to be 109.4 million and giving us a variance of 415,000 so far. And for the rating ratio, this is one of the things that we have added it. Uh, fiscal year budget is 1.3, and the rating agency ratio so far is 1.32. And like I said, we're still uh, in the early stages, so moving forward, we'll have more data coming in, and we'll be able to have more uh, numbers with more accuracy as well. Any questions? I've got one. Eric has a question. The debt service is about $3 million uh, below what uh, was budgeted. Is, is that just because of how it cycles through? That uh, just hit in at the, it hits at a different time? Correct. Okay. Anybody have any additional questions for HAE? Thank you, sir. Uh, that was a great report. Uh, next on the agenda uh, is going to be uh, the financial subcommittee report with Matt Matheson. Matt, it's all yours. Thank you. Um, first, I want to say uh, thanks to Eric for filling in last month for me and uh, giving this report uh, on our last meeting that was uh, held by the subcommittee. Our next meeting is going to be. Uh, on November 5th at 8 o'clock, and the main objective at that meeting is to uh, clarify and and basically justify the three or four key financial planning policies 
that we've referred to as pillars uh, during the last couple of years. Um, our goal is to have settled any uh, issues uh, before we uh, start talking about the new financial plan uh, right after the first of the year. So uh, we're having uh, good discussions with the finance department and we appreciate that. And I appreciate the other subcommittee uh, members uh, participation in this. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Uh, anybody have questions for Matt? Okay, Matt, thank you very much, sir. Uh, next is going to be Asia. She's going to be talking about the CIP uh, subcommittee. Uh, Asia, it's all yours. Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, the CIP subcommittee has also scheduled a me meeting for December the 10th. We'll be meeting. Um, we, I don't know that, Jeanette, can you refresh my memory if we've set the agenda for that meeting? Not yet. So, okay, so we would still need to set the agenda for that meeting. And typically we are looking at the, you know, the upcoming, this kind of winter meeting, if we meet twice a year, we're starting to look at the, um, the CIP for the upcoming year and um, and also looking at that in the context of the larger plans, um, one of which right, we're hearing about today. Um, and then I, I am I'm thinking if we're meeting in December, we probably will also need another meeting um, uh, in in 2025. Um, but uh, yeah, just wanted to thanks everybody on the uh, CIP subcommittee for um, getting on. And, and getting that scheduled, I really appreciate it because I will be out of town directly after. So I look forward to getting that meeting in. Um, and um, any questions from the full committee or our subcommittee members? Anybody have any questions for Asia for CIP? Very good. Thank you, Asia. Uh, okay. next, on, next on the agenda is the uh, Citizen Water Advisory Committee, uh, CWAC, and that's uh, with uh, Alan. Yeah. So, uh, a couple of things. Uh, last uh, CWAC meeting, that I thought might be of interest was uh, staff did a couple uh, presentations. One was on the uh, history of the reclaimed water system. Uh, you, you may know this already, but this year's the 40th anniversary of when the system was first built. Um, it just went from here basically to Oklahoma. And um, so uh, it's, it's been a lot since then. And so they went through all the, you know, how that happened. And uh, it's a good presentation. Uh, and I think you can find those online if you're interested. The other one was related, uh, but basically they went over the 2023 reclaimed water uh, usage distribution kind of uh, statistics and accounting. It it's it's quite complex now with all the different you know some of the projects that uh, were talked about before the the lower Santa Cruz. Uh, Managed in channel, all of that, and a lot of different people are putting in, but it all comes from here, you know, essentially to begin with. So they have some really uh, complex, but they did it in a very understandable way about who's getting what, what credits are being developed for who throughout the whole system. And again, I think that presentation you can find online if you're interested in kind of who's doing what and how that all plays out. It, it's really interesting, but that was, uh, that was the bulk of it. Okay, very good. Thank you, Alan. Does anybody have any questions for Alan on CWAC? Okay, excellent. Uh, thank you, Alan. Uh, next on the agenda is our future. Uh, so are there any future agenda items? I know we previously just talked about a little bit about it. Anything else that you would like to add? Okay, it sounds like we're going to have a short future. 
Um, okay, thank you. Uh, no additional items for the future agenda. So we jump to call to the audience. So any calls uh, from the audience? Okay, I hear none. Uh, then we add adjournment. So do I have a motion to adjourn our meeting for this month? So, so moved. Okay, so I have a second. Second. Okay. And Steve. Okay, uh, very good. All in favor, uh, say aye. 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 Any nays? Or can't make up your mind and abstain? <laughs> okay, very good. Thank you, everyone. Uh, just want to let you know our next meeting is going to be on Thursday, November the 21st. Uh, we're going to be talking about director's update, long range uh, plans, uh, and uh, and also we added. Uh, please put on your notes. We're adding Ellen uh, is going to be talking about uh, the vacancy uh, information. Okay, thank you, everybody. Be safe out there. Uh, come back on the other side of Halloween. Thank you all. Have a good day. Thank Bye, you. Everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Yeah, I need to talk to you. <laughs> yeah. Bye.